Preparing for the future, Sri Lanka's president launches a plan to rewrite the constitution. How inclusive is the process, though? And will it take the country to a new era of ethnic harmony? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, a year into his term, Sri Lanka's president, Maithripala Sirisena, has a message for parliament. Back to the drawing board. Sirisena says Sri Lanka needs a new constitution to prevent a new war. Well, he was referring, of course, to the decades-long civil conflict that ended in 2009. So he and Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe are calling for electoral reforms they say will promote ethnic reconciliation. They add the new constitution will also lessen presidential powers, an idea, of course, Sarasena campaigned for last year. We'll get to our discussion in just a moment, but first, Minel Fernandez sets things up from Colombo. Giving thanks for his first year in office. Twelve months after defeating his boss to the presidency, Maitripala Sirisena has reason to celebrate. What has happened is phenomenal. This has captured the imagination of the world. I think Sri Lanka is one of the points of hope in the whole, whole world at this point. That's praise coming from an organization which echoed many international voices that criticized the previous government mainly for the way it ended the war with the Tamil Tigers, fighting for a separate state in the north and east. But the new president has not had it easy. He has brought change, but says there's important work to be done. We must build the environment needed for all people of this country to live with mutual trust and a sense of brotherhood in an undivided nation. Sirisena's government has begun work on a new constitution and the entire parliament will be involved in the process. In building a country and working towards its future, do not forget that this August Assembly is the only institution that can be responsible for this country's future. Working with political parties with different ideas will be tough. When he took oaths at Independence Square behind me exactly a year ago, President Maitripala Sirisena said the biggest challenge Sri Lanka faces is bringing together the minds of the people of the North and South. In the last year, he's taken many steps to do so, but some feel that more can be done. Namdidi's husband was arrested three years ago for helping the Tamil Tigers. But he was not charged in court until earlier this week. She says he and other Tamils being held must be released. They don't need to be punished further. If they are released, they won't do anything because they have suffered enough. They just want to spend time with their families. Sivaraja Jeninan is looking forward to doing that after receiving a presidential pardon. He was serving 10 years in prison for trying to kill Sirisena in 2006. While things worked out for Jeninan, families of a number of journalists are still waiting for justice. The outspoken editor, Lasantha Vikramatunga, was killed in broad daylight seven years ago. Our hope is that by next January, we will be able to see some form of justice meted out and establishment of media freedom so that maybe we can think, OK, it's no longer black as we used to think it was. Analysts say the government of Maitripala Sirisena has made a solid beginning. Now the test is whether it can maintain the trust and confidence it won and deliver on expectations at home and abroad. Vina Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. Let's bring our guests into the show then. In Colombo, we have Rohan Ediri Singer, constitutional academic and former professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Colombo. In London, Sutharashan Sukumaran, co editor of the Tamil Guardian. And also in Colombo, joining us by Skype, Alan Keenan, senior analyst and Sri Lanka project director at the International Crisis Group. Welcome to all of you. If I could start first with Rohan. Is the government's approach to involve all members of parliament in the process of rewriting the constitution, do you see that as a good step forwards towards a non-partisan consensus-based constitution? Yes, I do. I think it's a good start. The problem with Sri Lanka's previous constitutions was that they were both partisan documents introduced by governments in power, which had two-thirds majorities, and so 
they were able to introduce the constitution without reaching out to the opposition. This time round, President Sirisen and the Prime Minister have promised to involve all the political parties in Parliament. However, it is also well, important on, to recognise that why should we a constitution believe him this has to be drafted. What, what's different this time? Previous constitutions were written or amended by with parliamentary involvement. Why should we take this one more seriously this time? Because this time round you have a coalition government consisting of the two main political parties and they will therefore be working in partnership. Also this time round, I think there is a recognition that there has to be public engagement and civil society involvement in drafting and adopting a constitution. And that is why the resolution calling for the setting up of a constituent assembly and also a process of public engagement is something that I think is quite positive. All right. So Rahan, optimistic there. Sotha Rashan, do you share the optimism that what will come out of this process will be something that is very inclusive? Um, I think so. The, the intended statement by the government, which says it's doing a new constitution to promote the rule of law, to establish good governance, to get rid of the executive presidency and to promote national reconciliation. Um, so the themes that they've put out sound very uh, progressive and they, it, it does form an opportunity. But I think the, the question is understanding what were the previous issues faced in uh, drafting a constitution that could bring long term stability to the island. Now, I think, as many people that have been involved in Sri Lanka will know, um, there has been this ethnic conflict which has kind of plagued the island for over four or five decades. And now, how do we address this? Because Rohan did mention in previous parliaments, um, it was uh, the government in power which passed through constitutions with a two-third majority. Now, this is quite interesting because a new constitution is going to look to address several different issues. So on issues of good governance, uh, getting rid of the executive presidency, you may see the two-thirds majority and you may see the changes that are enacted that get passed through the parliament. But now on the longest issue that has stopped stability on the island, which is the ethnic issue and the Tamil national question and, and the Tamil aspirations, are we going to be able to get a, a wide consensus among the island in terms of uh, the southern polity and all the political parties in the south to agree with the aspirations of the Tamil parties in the north. When actually um, we've already seen signs where just in the recent parliamentary elections um, we saw kind of the elected mandate of the Tamil people in the north almost wholehearted, not wholeheartedly, but rejected across the political, political spectrum uh, in the south. So these issues that we need to see, we need to think about and how we can established the Tamil aspirations into Sri Lanka's new constitution. All right, that, that, we'll come to that question in a moment, but I want to pick up on the earlier point uh, that you mentioned about creating a more sort of balanced uh, system of power with uh, perhaps more uh, checks and balances. Alan, do you see that the president is genuinely committed to that so sort of change through this process? And is, are the parties behind him on that point? Well, those would be two separate issues. Um, I, my sense is the president is committed to abolishing the executive presidency or coming something very close to that. That's what he campaigned on. He supported that in the past. And I think if you look at his style of governance, he's been very conscious about trying to um, rule in a less authoritarian, uh, less uh, Why, aggressive Alan? What, what motivates way. him to be different from some of his predecessors? Well, I think, um, I don't know. I've not actually ever met the president. I would love to, so I can't speak from personal experience. But um, he appears to uh, take very seriously his um, his good governance principles, and his. Uh, I think it has something to do with his, his Buddhist uh, practice. And I think um, it's also, you know, that's his legacy. I, I think he sees as a politician that he came in on a particular platform, and that was a key part of it, getting rid of the executive presidency and not ruling in the dynastic uh, authoritarian way of his predecessor, the Rajapaksas. And, um, you know, he, that's his credibility. If he begins to uh, move away from that, then he becomes just another Sri Lankan politician. And, um, I mean, he may, he obviously is in some other ways very much a Sri Lankan politician, but sort of his brand, I think, if you want to look at it that way, um, is to be different on, the, on those and related issues. And I think he's trying very much to stick to that with a few lapses here and there. But um, so far, I think uh, there's no reason to doubt that he wants that. Okay. But the second part of your question. Yeah, the second part. Is there the enough parties. support behind him from the different political parties for that? <clears throat> well, I think there's significant resistance within the SLFP, his own party, which, of course, is divided pretty much 
within in terms of the parliamentary group pretty much straight down the middle 50 50 uh with him and 50 uh the other 50 uh with rajapaksa um and uh i think there's less commitment on the rajapaksa camp to abolish the executive presidency although some of the parties uh, some of the smaller parties that are backing rajapaksa actually are formally committed to it as are in fact most politicians and parties in sri lanka but um if it's seen as um, as helping the current government and particularly helping the UNP, the party of the prime minister, I think there's a lot of there'll be a lot of um, resistance from within the SLFP. Um, but the smaller parties, I think, uh, so the JVP, which is um, has a kind of a public influence, I think beyond its its numbers in parliament, I think they're strongly backing uh, the abolishing of the executive. Uh, uh, presidency and would be would shout very loudly if that seemed not to be happening. Interesting. Rohan, do you agree with that or are you more optimistic about whether the abolition of the executive presidency is, is something that will actually see the light of day beyond slogans? No, I'm optimistic about the abolition of the executive presidency. What I'm a little bit more concerned about is the other aspects of constitutional reform which I think are as important you know, ensuring that the Constitution is supreme, improving the Bill of Rights, uh, having a, a new electoral system which uh, results in inclusive elections, greater women's representation, greater minority representation. So there are other aspects of the Constitution where I think uh, uh, the political parties have focused less on the need for reform in those areas. And then, of course, as our colleague said, the most difficult challenge will be uh, introducing uh, constitutional reform to address the reasonable aspirations of the Tamil people in particular. I'm glad you've put your finger on that point because, as we've been saying, some of the main uh, reforms in the draft constitution will be about equality among Sri Lanka's different ethnic groups. Well, up until now, the Sinhalese majority, who make up almost three-fourths of the population, have had the most say in government. And they've come into conflict, of course, with the ethnic Tamils, who are the largest minority with almost 20% of the population. Conflict between the two groups led to a civil war that started in 1983 and lasted more than 25 years. Well, the United Nations says about 40,000 mainly Tamil citizens were killed towards the end of that war. But even after the war ended in 2009, some human rights groups say the oppression of ethnic Tamils has in fact continued. Sutharashan, do you think that this push for constitutional change will in the end lead to a real change in the balance of power between the majority and, and the minorities? I think we need to think about where we're starting. So before we even the announcement of a new constitutional process is a, is a welcomed announcement. But first we need to see, do we have a conducive environment to allow for this constitution to be all inclusive in the first place? So I guess when you look at the current situation, there are already provisions in the constitution that don't provide for a conducive environment to make it all inclusive and to, um, to allow for this to happen. So for example, we have things like um, the Sixth Amendment of the constitution, which actually uh, it kind of violates a treaty that Sri Lanka has already signed up to, which is the ICCPR at the UN. So the Sixth Amendment criminalizes any, um, any discussion around uh, the aspirations of self-determination, which has been a long-standing issue for the Tamil people, which they've voted for uh, democratically several times in several elections. But hang on, um, Sutharashan, on all of, of this should be up now for review and discussion if the constitution's being rewritten, right? Why are you still unhappy with the environment surrounding it? Because like you mentioned before, we've had uh, instances of ongoing um, human rights abuses. So the most recent uh, NGO report by the International Truth and Justice Project last week released found that people had been tortured just for um, campaigning around the Tamil National Alliance uh, election manifesto in September. So there is still this environment of uh, fear and torture and, and, and kind of militarization of the North and East. And this is the problem. Like, even when you have a good constitution, it's the implementation of that. For example, right now, before, before this constitution change was announced in Sri Lanka, the constitution doesn't allow for arbitrary, arbitrary detention uh, of people. However, a provision that was brought under the PTA undermines the current constitution and allows for people to be detained for, with no reason. So right. these are the kind of uh, the issues that we need to face when thinking about a new constitution. How do we first pre uh, make an environment conducive 
um, for discussion around the Constitution in the first place. All right. Rahan, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Is the environment not being, despite everything that Siri Sena says, the environment when it comes to dealing with minorities, particularly the Tamils, is not right for a real free and deep discussion about changing the Constitution. What's your thought on that? I, I agree that the environment is not ideal, but I think we've got to make the most of this opportunity. There's been a tremendous change as a result of the presidential and parliamentary elections in 2015. And while the situation may not be ideal and human rights violations may continue, the old mindset within certain elements of the, the military and the police do still continue. I do uh, feel that this is a tremendous opportunity. And you have the leader of the opposition, who's the leader of the main Tamil political party, uh, having a very good working relationship, both with the president, prime minister, and the former president. And this creates uh, a kind of counter environment, which I think offers some hope. But, but and Rohan, can, can thing, ordinary think, citizens to, seize to make the most that of this opportunity? opportunity? Can ordinary citizens seize that opportunity when, for example, the United Nations Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances noted in their last visit on November the 18th, quote, an almost complete lack of accountability and decisive and sustained efforts to search for the truth. They go on to note uh, the whereabouts of dis disappeared people. And they call upon the Sri Lankan authorities to, quote, give clear instructions that all types of threats, harassment and intimidation towards families uh, must stop. I mean, with that sort of environment, to come to uh, Suthara Shan's point, how can people have a free and open discussion about what they want from the next constitution, even if the president does have good working relations with Tamil politicians? Well, I Yeah, but I think there is still scope in the north and the east for civil society to organize meetings to, uh, uh, I mean, I was up in Jaffna in January after the election, um, you know, people, stu university students, university academics, various civil society groups were, were talking freely about political issues. This is not to deny the points made by our colleague, but, but my point is that the environment has improved and this is an opportunity that must be seized because the forces who are opposed to change, the, the, the forces close to the Rajapaksas, are waiting for an opportunity to make a comeback. And this is a, a six-month period or perhaps a year in which serious constitutional discussion can take place. And I think that notwithstanding all these problems about the environment, uh, we have to make a, an effort to really address the core issues, the core constitutional issues, so that they are incorporated in the third Republican constitution of Sri Lanka. All right, before we come to some of those other core issues, Alan, what do you make of the suggestion that actually, while some of the focus understandably needs to be on rewriting new provisions of the constitution when it comes to devolution of power and the treatment of minorities and so on, but others would argue that actually there are amendments like the 13th Amendment in the current Constitution that allows some devolution of power. The problem is not the lack of provision. The problem is with the implementation of provisions. And arguing over what new amendments or provisions are put in won't change anything if they don't see the light of day. Well, that's, uh, that's true. Um, I mean, I think I'd say yes and no. I mean, certainly... The 13th Amendment is a very um, ambiguous, uh, badly written um, uh, document, which gives lots of powers to the central government to take back in a variety of different means uh, the powers which are on paper devolved to the provinces. Now, if, um, if the central government were really serious about making the most of it, and if they had a willing partner in the, in the provinces, and the mo one most important would be the North, uh, who wanted to make use of those powers, then I think you could do something with the 13th Amendment. Um, unfortunately, you don't have an, a Northern Provincial Council that seems very interested in making use of its powers, and you don't have um, a, a center which is, for which that's really their priority. So nothing much has happened under the, the, under the last couple of years since you've had an elected province, uh, Provincial Council there. But I think ultimately you need to, um, I mean, think all scholars 
uh, well, not all scholars, but most scholars that I know and trust and respect would argue that um, that you need to go beyond the 13th Amendment, that it's just written in a way that um, even if it was used and implemented correctly, would still not uh, really meet the full aspirations of, um, of Tamils in the North and the East, but which also doesn't fully empower um, all the all the, mem the the citizens in all the other provinces throughout the country of all ethnicities. So I think um, yes, you could do a lot more than you have done than the governments have done with the uh, 13th Amendment, but it wouldn't be enough. All right. What about things like introducing the Bill of Rights, uh, Sutharashan? If there's movement even on paper towards those sorts of things, will that not rub off on all citizens um, of Sri Lanka, including the Tamils? Um, I, I think to a certain extent, but uh, I'd also like to add to what Alan Keenan said about the 13th Amendment. As well as scholars, I think even by the Tamil people, the Tamil National Alliance in their manifesto also say the 13th Amendment is not adequate to solve the issues, the long-standing issues that the Tamils have faced. Um, and that, that's where it comes down to. I think even the ICG uh, during parliamentary elections last year said the, the main, one of the long-standing issues is the centralization over power um, ethnically in Colombo. And that's one of the, the biggest issues. So things like good governance and rule of law, Sri Lanka has enjoyed that before. I think under Rajapaksa, things like rule of law, good governance really did deteriorate. But there have been other stages where good governance, rule of law, and open market liberalization has uh, flourished in Sri Lanka. However, what hasn't changed is the ethnic issue. Um, and going back to what we were speaking about, do you how think it's different this time? Do you think that with President Sirisena now at the helm, that things are different? He generally does want a devolution of power. Or what are your thoughts? And on that? this is where I, this is where we can try and be analytical. Like, so the statements are very good. The issue is there are there are easy wins that can be made to produce this conducive environment. For example, so things like. The, the problem of militarization, where there is 85% of an ethnic Sinhalese military in the traditionally Tamil homelands of the North and East, um, it's never mentioned as an issue. For example, if, if the president said, we need to produce a conducive environment by redistributing our military to the south, that shows a tangible measure that Sirisena is thinking about to produce this environment for a good new constitution. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been many small checks and balances that he could commit to to show that he is committed. Um, for example, again, during the parliamentary elections, um, key, key demands by the TNA in their elections were things like remerging the northern and eastern provinces because they are traditionally Tamil homelands, um, accepting that there should be the, self, the right to self-determination of the Tamil people, and so on. And what, the reason why we've had so many constitutions and we haven't seen success is because there is this one, another factor that seems to always ruin the process. So in, in the 50s, we had a pact between the Tamils, the Tamil polity and the Sinhalese polity, which was ripped apart. Um, there was a stage where we had the peace process uh, when the LTT was there, where there was a, a solution accepted by the international community and the Tamil people, right. and that fell apart. And something keeps ruining this process. And I think this is what we need to tackle. And All right, we've got, we've got 60 seconds left. What keeps ruining the process, Rohan, and how is it being tackled differently this time in 60 seconds? Well, the challenge is the one about the national issue. And the question is this. The issue is this. Sri Lanka is committed to a unitary state under the present constitution. You have people like our colleagues who are talking about the right to self-determination uh, and uh, uh, you know, probably not even clarifying that that's internal self-determination. And the middle ground seems to be a federal type constitutional arrangement. And so the enabling environment will require also, Tamil nationalists to adopt a more moderate position, as indeed the TNA has in recent weeks, so that some sort of compromise is possible. Otherwise, right. the third Republican Constitution project will fail. Well, let's hope it doesn't. I let's hope that... Uh, all right, I'll, I'll give you five seconds. I'd also like to add that I think it's the Sri Lankan president has to do the hard talk All right. with the singular majoritarian community Five about seconds equal is aspirations. Out, Sutharashan. Thank you yeah. both gentlemen. I'm sure we can continue this for a, and we probably will uh, in the future. But for now, let's thank our guests, Rohan Adirisinga, Sutharashan Sukumaran and Alan Keenan.
And thank you for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on the program page of our website, aljazeera.com. You can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the team here for now, it's goodbye.